Gentlemen, among the Winchester House's uh, unique features are stairs that lead to blank walls and corridors that lead to unopenable, do uh, unopenable doors. The house contains uh, five different heating systems. Uh, some of the 13 bathrooms have clear glass doors. One room has four fireplaces. A spiral staircase has 42 steps, two inches high and other stairways simply melt into walls. In addition, one closet is as big as a three-bedroom apartment. Most of you ladies would like to have that, okay? And everywhere the number 13 is evident. 13 stair steps, 13 hangers in a closet, 13 lights in a chandelier, 13 uh, windows in a room, all 160 of them. The house was built by the uh, widow of William Wirt Winchester, uh, who was the son of the man who manufactured the famous Winchester repeating rifles used so widely and devastatingly in the 19th century. The house is also referred to as Guilt House. Apparently it was built because a spiritualist in Boston told Mrs. Winchester that if she would move west and start a never-ending building project that she would not only achieve eternal life, but she would provide a home for the souls of those people killed by Winchester rifles, fully believing that her building project would indeed relieve her guilt. Mrs. Winchester worked on it right up until her death in 1922. It's truly astonishing what some people will do to get rid of their guilt or deal with their guilty feelings. All of us have these kinds of feelings, and sometimes we're haunted by them as well. The good news this morning is that God has a much better plan than any spiritualist can give us, or anyone else for that matter, because His works. And with that, let's pick up our reading, beginning at verse 1 in John's Gospel, chapter 8, a story that is probably pretty familiar to all of you. Here we are. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and he began to teach them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery, and having set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now the law of Moses commanded us, Makes you wonder if these guys were not peeping toms. That's just my personal opinion. But anyway, now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? And as they were saying this, testing him, in order that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and he said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the midst. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Now go your way, and from now on, sin no more. And personally, I think this is one of the more fascinating stories uh, in Jesus' earthly ministry that we have presented to us in the Gospels. As was His custom, we're told, uh, that Jesus occupied, in verse 2, we're told that Jesus occupied a place in the temple's outer courts to teach. And John tells us also in verse 2 that Jesus, as usual, never had any trouble attracting a crowd, neither did he on this occasion. People were still streaming to hear Jesus teach, and he never had a problem with the crowd, including, apparently, some of the religious elites probably just to check out the competition. By now, they were up in arms with, over Jesus, and by now, they had had it up to here with Jesus, 
And the relationship between the Pharisees, the religious elites, and Jesus was an adversarial relationship and probably for good reason. Jesus had far more people listening to him than they did. And and that's just one of the many things that threatened them about Jesus. And besides, Jesus was dangerous. He had dared to expose them for the frauds that they were. And on one occasion he said that their methodology for taking Gentile, non-Jews, and turning them into Jewish converts to believe in the one true God made them twice the sons of hell that they were. He actually said that. Well, such statements could not go unchallenged, and a frontal attack on Jesus simply wouldn't work. They tried that repeatedly without success. And so they had to concoct schemes to eliminate the competition and get rid of Jesus once and for all. And the story we have before us this morning is just one more of those schemes. So they trotted out a woman who they said had been caught in the act of adultery. They asked Jesus whether she should be stoned, but they weren't really interested in justice. Let's get that straight right at the beginning. Their only interest, and John tells us this, their only interest, in fact, was to get Jesus to say something that would get him hung. It's interesting, isn't it? Last time I checked, it takes two persons to commit adultery. So we might naturally ask, where was the man? But then, this is not about justice, as I already said. And so for the moment, though, I want you to put yourself in this woman's shoes, or more properly, sandals. How would you feel if you were her? I would feel condemned. I would feel condemned. Here are some guys dragging you through the streets, and they drag you through the streets in a very public manner, and they drag you into the church parking lot, and all the time they're saying, look here, look here, look what we're going to do with this woman. And then they throw her in front of Jesus, of whom undoubtedly they had heard he was, she, he, she had heard that he was a holy man. And there she stands in front of this astonishing religious teacher with all of these other religious leaders pointing the finger at her. And there in the crowd gathered around her thinking, well, we can only imagine what they were thinking. And let us remember that adultery was a capital offense, death by stoning, and it was used very, very widely. And just like this woman, we also feel condemned in our hearts and minds because we often feel accused. In this woman's case, though, there seems to be no question about her guilt. In fact, Jesus seems to accept it as fact. However, Jesus isn't the one who's pointing the finger at her. God does not do that. He does convict us. He does do that. He does confront us with our sin, and He confronts us with this, but He will not maliciously accuse us. That kind of accusation comes from the enemy, the devil himself, from our adversary, not our advocate, whom John tells us in his first epistle to the churches is Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus knew what these guys were up to, and He also knew their hidden agenda. They were accusers, those with a judgmental spirit who delight in constantly pointing out your every misstep, your every misdeed. Such people always have an agenda. In In the case of this woman's accusers, they... Their agenda wasn't to punish a guilty person. Their agenda was to use her as bait to get at Jesus. They no doubt by now knew of Jesus' disposition and that He would most likely, probably at least, prescribe mercy in her case. And if they did, then they could accuse Him of, before all the people now, of breaking the law of Moses. They could even imply that he was in sympathy with this woman's sinful act. So these accusations and these actions obscure the real issues. We, like the Pharisees sometimes, are quick to judge others because by focusing on their sin, then we won't have to deal with our own glaring sinfulness. 
That was certainly true in the case of this woman's accusers. Their accusations cover up the evil intent of their own hearts. This condemnation by accusation methodology never originates from God. And as I said, God will convict us of our sins. God will uh, deal with us and He will confront us with our sins. He will point out to us the corresponding effect of our sins and our relationship with Him. But God will not rub our noses in it as these self-righteous hypocrites were doing to this woman. Neither will God wink at our sin like some kindly, benevolent grandfather. He hates sin because he knows how much it hurts us. He knows how much death and destruction that it brings to us. And he knows what will happen if he lets it slide. But, fast forwarding a little bit in this story. What Jesus says to this woman in a few minutes are these words. Neither do I condemn you. Now the word condemn that he uses twice in verse that's used twice in verses 10 to 11 go back and look at those two verses means to find guilty to pronounce sentence but let's dig a little deeper it comes from a strong greek verb to me, that means to judge with a preposition down thus to judge down Jesus simply refused to do that she was already self-condemned how could she feel any worse, I ask you? How could she feel any worse? He would not condemn one who stood guilty before him. Make no, no mistake about it, he would not condone her sin. But that's not the issue here, is it? The issue here is using someone to get at Jesus, even their sin. Manipulating what they have done for their own purposes. Jesus wasn't about to get caught up in their game. He wasn't about to let someone be used in such a manipulative and malicious way. And she already felt guilty. He didn't need to add anything for her to feel any worse. What she needed and what we all need is acceptance and a way to find true forgiveness. And that's the direction in which Jesus will now go. With her accusers pointing fingers at her, with the crowd staring holes at her, through her, she stands isolated before Jesus. Surely the, thro the thought mo must have crossed her mind. I wonder what he thinks. Now, I've read this story many, many times. I'm sure that many of you did, have done. And I've come to a few conclusions about this story. Jesus was certainly sitting while he was teaching because that was the custom of the day. Unlike teachers and preachers who stand today to teach and preach, Jesus was sitting. And the text tells us, you kind of have to read between lines, especially from the original language, that the accuser's club made her stand before Jesus. And so here she stands, alone, condemned, and quite literally, a stone's throw from death. Everyone is against her. No one is for her. In every way she stands alone, physically, emotionally, spiritually. So she must have been very puzzled then by Jesus' response to the accusations that are leveled at her. I don't think that Jesus ever looked up at her while he was sitting, at least not yet. Okay, He heard their accusing, accusing words, and he stooped down, and he began writing in the sand. Now, you need to understand, there has been endless speculations about what he wrote all down through the centuries. My personal belief, I think he was doodling in the sand. Really. Maybe he was playing tic-tac-toe. In any event, I think what Jesus was doing, he's sitting there writing in the sand, and I think he was just trying to let these guys know he'd had enough of them. He had had enough of them, and he would hope that they'd just go away, leave him and her alone so he could deal with her. But of course, they didn't go away. So when he does speak, 
He straightens up and he looks at these accusers straight in the eye and he says, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. You'll notice, no one took him up on his offer. What Jesus was doing here was something that these religious elites had no intention of doing with her or with anyone else for that matter. He was creating a climate of acceptance. Because it is only in a climate of acceptance that we can experience God's grace. It is only in a climate of acceptance that we can find a path toward forgiveness. These guys, forgiveness was far from their mind. That was the last thing on their minds. And so that's what Jesus was doing. In a situation in which she was guilty, so that she desperately needed forgiveness. What she didn't deserve is what these guys, these accusers, heaped upon her, and that is shame. Now folks, we get true guilt from God. But we get shame from someone or something else. Let's make sure we understand that. This woman wore her shame like Nathaniel Hawthorne's leading character wore the Scarlet A in his novel. She received her shame from the same people who intended to show up at Jesus. They did not merely accuse her. They shamed her as badly as they could. And that they did this publicly, so publicly, tells us a great deal about their motives. When we feel condemned, we are blanketed with shame. And our greatest need when we are blanketed with shame is for acceptance. This woman probably wore her shame and felt her shame all of her life. Perhaps her adulterous act was simply part of a destructive lifestyle fed by her shame. John Wilkes Booth believed in slavery, but did not lift a finger to save it. The South lost its war that it had fought to preserve slavery, if you believe that was the primary cause, okay? But he had been too much of a coward to do anything for the cause. His cowardice shamed him. I despise myself, he wrote in one of his diaries. He also said that to several other people. And he went out looking for a chance to escape his, chain, his shame. His chance came when a play entitled My American Cousin was going to, be, was o- going to open at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. It was rumored that the president would attend. attend. Abraham Lincoln was a sacrifice to shame. People do bad things because of their shame. The childhoods of some of the most foremost villains of recent history prove this to be a true fact. Adolf Hitler, Lee Harvey Oswald, Saddam Hussein. Go back and look at their childhood. Most every monster was a disowned child, abused or abandoned, and made to feel unworthy and unwanted. They did great evil that was consistent with shame they felt for themselves. Shame people do bad things to escape their shame. Perhaps this behavior, as I said before, was what caused this woman to stand before Jesus. In any event, to be dragged before Him in His presence and looking made her shame already magnified, not just to her, but to everyone around her. Is it surprising, though, that these representatives of graceless religion were her accusers? Not really. Religion without grace ties shame around our souls like a choke chain, and never offers relief. When the Japanese foreign minister walked across the battleship Missouri to to sign Japan's unconditional surrender, he felt stared at and despised by the crew. 
Never have I realized the glances of glaring eyes could hurt so much. We waited in public like penitent boys, and every moment seemed like ages. I imagine that this is how this woman felt pushed in front of Jesus by these leaders of graceless religion. If ever someone needed acceptance, this woman did at that moment. And what she needed, even before she needed forgiveness, was to know that God accepted her, affirmed her, held her, uh, and owned her, and would never let go of her, even if He wasn't all that impressed with what He had on His hands. And after her accusers walked away, and after the crowd had melted away as well, Jesus throws her a lifeline of acceptance with the Word. Neither do I condemn you. And the weight of shame began to fall off her shoulders like the chains of a shackled prisoner. Jesus would not shame her nor condemn her. What he did next, though, is instructive. We dare not miss this. He said, and literally from the original language, Go now and leave your life of sin. Go now and leave your life of sin. He was telling her she could be forgiven. But forgiveness begins with repentance. Turning away from sin. I mean, what kind of forgiveness is it that overlooks our sin. The very thing that deals destruction and death to us. What kind of God would say to people, now it's okay if you sin, I'm going to forgive you anyway, knowing that sin enslaves us, knowing the pain that it brings us, knowing the problems that, that is with it, knowing how sin robs us, depraves us, kills us, and separates us from Him eternally. That's not the God of the Bible. He cares too much about us. And He cares too much about letting sin harm us and which is why He sent Jesus to the cross in the first place. We dare not mistake God's acceptance of us for some superficial absolution of sin. But He did say to her, Go now, sin no more. Leave your life of sin. Words to a drowning person. Words of hope for people who feel condemned. Jesus is implying that forgiveness is hers for the asking. And the proof of the asking is leaving behind the sin. That's it. Once we know that we have been accepted and embraced by the loving and holy God, then we can experience forgiveness. When Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you, He is opening up the possibility of forgiveness to her. Once she accepts, once we accept, what God wants to give to us is a fresh start. He wants us to be set free so that we can live as His beloved children. Go and leave your life of sin implies that she indeed had been sinning. But because she had met and experienced Jesus' acceptance, she could now be forgiven and she could now throw off the enslavement of her sin. Jesus offers her and Jesus offers all of us a fresh start at this point. He is saying to her, He is saying to us, I'm offering you forgiveness. I'm willing to wipe the slate clean. But you have to receive it. And receiving that forgiveness changes us. King Henry IV was kept waiting for three days barefoot in the alpine snow for the Pope to forgive him. God does not keep us waiting. The fact is, we often keep God waiting for forgiveness. Too proud to come to Him, too proud and too caught up in our own lifestyles, in our own stuff to see what sin is doing to us to experience His forgiveness. But once we do, 
Just as I am sure this woman's life was changed, once we do, our lives will be changed. How can I say that? Because there's one thing that I've learned from looking at all the encounters that Jesus had in the Gospels. No one leaves a true encounter with Jesus without being changed. Go and leave your life sin. In T.S. Eliot's The Cocktail Party, a woman by the name of Cecilia is talking to her psychiatrist, Riley. She's talking about something that she had done was really bothering her conscience. And Riley asked her, what was the point of view in your family when you were growing up about the word sin? And she replied that she had been taught to disbelieve it and to think of misbehavior as bad form and that anyone who was overly concerned with guilt was a bit kinky. But she admits that she had been unable to dispose of her sense of personal failure so easily. She says, I continue to be bothered by a feeling of uncleanness, a feeling of personal failure, of the, or, or a feeling of emptiness, or failure towards someone or something outside of myself. And I feel that I must atone. Is that the right word? Tell me. Can you help a person with such a mind as that? Well, Riley can't, but Jesus can and has and does. And besides, only Jesus is qualified to atone for our sin, which He did at the cross. Forgiveness is ours then when we truly experience Jesus. This woman experienced Jesus' forgiveness and his acceptance when he said to her, go and leave your life of sin. And he says that to all of us who will come to him with our sin and lay it at his feet and ask for his forgiveness. He forgives us. And here's the kicker. And in forgiving us, he gives us the power to live increasingly free of sin. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. That does not mean that we can someday attain perfection. We will never be perfect. Everybody get that? We will continue to stumble. We will continue to fall around and we'll continue to sin. But here's the point. When Jesus changes us by the power of His forgiveness, then what happens is God's power at work in us we will increasingly be able to see the grip and the hold of sin released on our lives. And I ask you, who would not want such a life? Who would not want a life increasingly free of the grip of sin on us? Jesus offers that life. And only Jesus can give it. Let's pray together. And as we pray, I'm going to have our blessing so that when we go out here in a few moments to eat, we will have already blessed the food. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord, for the story that we have, the encounter that we have of Jesus and this woman caught in adultery. We thank you, Lord, for how instructive this story is. That Jesus would not allow her to be used, manipulated, and He would not be manipulated. But we also thank you, Lord, for how much we learn about your acceptance of us and the possibility of forgiveness if only we will come to you with our sins for your forgiveness. When we do, our lives will be changed. That's what we pray for. Every person here. That our lives, all of us, will be changed by the power of your forgiveness. Because that power so changes us, we will leave behind 
the life of sin. But only you can give us that power. I thank you that you do. In a few moments, Lord,